I know you've got an ear out for the start of the podcast, but before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to remind you to keep an eye out for Daryl Lee's limited edition Christmas treats, because they're in stores now. Like the iconic Christmas nougat pudding, so yummy and a, and a gorgeous little gift. And some delicious Chrissy-themed twists on your favourite treats, like the Daryl Lee Rockley Road with chewy red and green jelly pieces, green and red crunchy milk chocolate balls, my favourites, and green apple and strawberry flavoured licorice. Watch them disappear. Your Christmas treats table will pop with colour and scrumptiousness. Spread some joy, bring the fun, and enjoy the Christmas tradition that is Daryl Lee. Hurry before they sell out. Daryl Lee makes Christmas better. This is The Five of My Life with me, Nigel Marsh. The series where I talk to notable people about five of their defining things. The way it works is my guests always choose a favourite film, book, song, place and possession. They tell me their choices in advance so I can research them, but they don't tell me why they've chosen them. That's the subject of our conversation. The reason I devised this series is I wanted to create a slightly different way to gain an insight into the real lives and thoughts of prominent people. Jeanette Francis, better known as Jan Fran, is a Walkley award-winning journalist, TV presenter and internet commentator. Best known for her work on The Project, The Feed and The Briefing, she's shot documentaries all over the world. She's also the creator, writer and presenter of the online opinion segment, The Frant, which has been viewed more than 20 million times. So, Jan, welcome to the five of my life and also welcome to the exclusive Sixer Club, that group of people who have been specifically requested by another five of my life guest in response to my traditional six question. And you were nominated by Jamila Rizvi. I was, yeah. She's dobbed me in and good on her for doing that. Could could you tell me, uh, just talk to me about that relationship. I have no idea how you know her or, or don't. So Jamila and I host a podcast together called The Briefing, which we co-host with Annika Smithhurst and Tom Tilley, and that's what we're doing together at the moment. But I've known Jamila for a while. I used to work on a show called The Feed, and she used to kind of come in and be a guest on The Feed. And I just, I liked her from the minute I heard her voice. She's one of those people that I just thought, who is that? I want to get to know her a little bit more. And um, it kind of transpired that we had a lot of opportunities to cross paths. Um, and we had lunch the last time I was in Melbourne. I always make a point of reaching out and saying, oh, I'm in town. Let's let's catch up. Let's do something. Um, and likewise, her in Sydney. And that's sort of how we know each other. Women about town, <laughs> <laughs> if I do say so myself. <laughs> well, listen, I hope when you listen to her Five More Life, you'll learn some new things about her. And I hope we're going to learn some new things about you. And we're going to start with your film. And you have chosen a film that when it was released in 2018 at the Cannes Film Festival, it got a 15-minute standing ovation. Yeah. It is the most successful Arabic film ever made. And I have to say, and I'm not supposed to pass judgment, I think it's one of the best films I've ever seen. Thank you. It's Capernaum. Have I I pronounced that right, Capernaum? Well, I don't know if I'm going to do any better a job. I mean, I speak Arabic and I still can't pronounce the name of the film properly, so please excuse me if I get it wrong, but I think it might be something like... Kafanaum. Oh my word! Okay. Maybe so. The P is not a hard P, but yeah. The, well, there's no P in Arabic. Ah, which is a weird thing. It's pronounced B. It might. It might not even be an Arabic word, but it's um. It's a very unusual word and a very unusual title for a film. It, uh, just the most sensational piece of movie making. Nardine Labaki. Labaki. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So, so tell us about the film and tell us why you've chosen it and your story behind it. This film I think is just a feat of cinema it is in it's in a category of its own it's one of those things that's like if if all of the other films are films this there has to be a new word to describe this film so it tells the story of um a young it's an Arabic film it's a Lebanese film the director's Lebanese woman and it tells the story of a young boy who has grown up in immense poverty in Lebanon and who's suing his parents for having him he's suing his parents for him being born and it kind of just goes through the trials and tribulations of being born into an extremely poor situation in Lebanon and weaves in so many different stories. And the two main actors, uh, or the stars of the show, 
are this young boy who I think is maybe 10 years old, if not younger, and then a baby, a baby who is a year old, a year and a half max. And these two just steal the sh- like I was mesmerised watching this movie and I watched it in Lebanon. So I went back to, Le- my background's Lebanese. I went back to Lebanon in, in 2018 for a wedding and it was a rainy day in Beirut and, you know, all of the festivities were sort of done and dusted and we probably had maybe one day left in the country. We thought, let's go and see a movie in Beirut. So we went to the cinema in Beirut um, and this movie was playing and we went in. It was me, my husband um, and my sister and we we watched this movie together and we sort of walked out of the cinema when it finished <laughs> and no one no one said anything. It was just like our our jaws had dropped to the ground so much that we just couldn't think of anything that we could possibly say about the film. It's truly extraordinary. And, and the the actor, the boy Zane, that is his life. I mean, not the exact things that happened. He is a refugee who lived in the slums in Beirut. He wasn't an actor. Just an astonishing. Thing. Yeah, he wasn't an actor. He was a he was a child that the director had um, found and they'd cast in this film and. Um, he, he, it was just one of the most incredible performances. And I think for me it was, you know, this moment where, because a lot of the art that we consume, it's very, you know, Western, isn't it? It's American, it's British, it's European. And um, I think sometimes art in the East tends to go uh, unnoticed or uncelebrated. And this was sort of one of the first times where I just thought, wow, look at what is coming out of Lebanon. It's, it's phenomenal. Tell me about the trip. So, so you, you you went to Lebanon. Was that was that your? Did you go regularly, or was it your first trip back, or what? No, I don't. I don't go regularly. Um, so we migrated. My family came out here in 1989. Um, I was four, um, and I've been back maybe a handful of times. So once in 2004, I went back in 07 as well, but that was just for a weekend because I was living in France at the time. And you can do that when you live in Europe, can't you? You can just duck to another country for a weekend. Um, whereas if you go anywhere for a weekend here, you're really in, still in New South Wales, frankly. Um, so I went back in 2018. This was for a wedding. It was uh, my my dad's cousin's wedding. And look, if anyone's related, if anyone's your dad's cousin, they're also your cousin. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and your cousin's cousin is also your cousin. Um, so it was a cousin's wedding and about 50 of us went up from Australia uh, in, in December of 2018. So it was like, you know, the, the buses were hired. We went on like family trips in like greyhound buses to see the cedars or to see all the ancient ruins. Um, and it was just, just the loveliest, one of the best trips I've ever had. I just, it, everyone was just in a good mood. You know, it's a wedding, it's festive. Um, people were just very celebratory, you know. Um, and so we went back to the village that my dad grew up in, um, spent time there because we have an aunt in the village. So my sisters and I went back there. We sort of did a little bit of a tour of the village with my dad's cousin, went back to the house that I was born and raised in, um, which is sort of sitting empty at the moment. Um, went to the cemetery where my grandfather is buried, where our where generations of our family are buried. And, you know, there's a family plot there that you walk into and you see, you know, my grandfather's name and his father's name and his father's father's name. And, you know, it's for someone like me who we are the first generation of migrants to come from Lebanon, right? So all of our ancestors are, are still... Well, they're over there, you know. Um, so I think that was the first time I'd ever seen that. That was. And, and do you think of it as home? I mean, as, I mean, I, I mean I, I'm an immigrant, uh, but I spent thirty-seven years somewhere else, and and I can't help when I see a road sign written in the in their typography, think, oh, that's sort of <laughs> it's a sort of home, even though I got no intention of going back, and I've been there twenty-five years. Yeah, that's a really good question. Home is a it's. I don't know if I've ever really felt anywhere was home. Um, Australia would be the closest for sure. And and Australia is my home. It's, it's you know, the place that 
that I live and that I love and that I see my future in and, and the future for my kids if I choose to have them. But um, there's a very a unique connection that happens in Lebanon. There's a saying, um, a country is not truly yours unless you have someone in the ground. And wow. I, I don't have anyone in the ground here, you know. I don't, um, I don't have an attachment to the land here. And for the first time, I, I felt an attachment to the land in that, Lebanon, that, the soil. That's an amazing phrase. That, that, that's something mm. where you've talked to, you know, to war widows who, whose sons or husbands or whatever have been buried overseas. Yeah. And, and you think, I've got a weird, you know, part of me in Vietnam or France or whatever. Because yeah. that's where, yeah. And that's, it's, it's a sort of a similar feeling. It's, there is a part of me that is here that is in in this place mm. um and uh, I, I i felt that very acutely the last time i was there and and how i mean i i i spent a year or so in the middle east is, is how, how is uh, lebanon doing because because from a, a an amateur's point of view who i haven't got family or connections mm. there is lebanon it is tragic in one way. It used to be this amazing Beirut, amazing city. They're just sort of like the Paris of the East or whatever, and then awful troubles and war. Is, is it, I mean, is it doing well? What a stupid thing to say, but is it, how is it when you went? Uh, the short answer is no. No, mm -hmm. it's absolutely, it's it's probably doing the worst it maybe has ever been doing uh -huh. um, since potentially the Civil War. My cousin, I used to have a cousin who, who'd say, you know what Lebanon's full of? Action. <laughs> Right. You know, that was a very diplomatic way of putting it, isn't it? It's just like you just you don't know what's around the corner. But unfortunately this year it's it's been in just tremendous economic depression. Did, um, did you feel safe when you were there for the wedding with your 49 other mates or, or family and mates? Yeah, I did. I right. did. And, you know, we, we have such deep connections there that, that you do feel safe because you have family um, and, and they know the situation. More than anything, but I had family who was uh, holidaying in 2006 when um, the war with Israel just broke out spontaneously, and they had to be shipped out of there. Um, so that's it. There you go. It's full of action, isn't it? Yeah. You just you don't you don't really know what's going to happen. Um, but yes, I did feel safe. I did have a minute where my partner was going to Baalbek, which is the um, these ancient ruins, incredible. Uh, he was going on his own and he is, I mean, he is the whitest man in Australia. <laughs> so <laughs> he's definitely going to be the whitest man in Lebanon. And he's this tall, six foot four, <laughs> ginger hair, <laughs> massive beard, just completely conspicuous. And I did have a minute where I thought, oh, I'm not going with him. He's going with our brother-in-law who whose Arabic is zero. He doesn't even, he's half Lebanese. And they're both enablers, so I thought if one of them has a dumb idea, the other one's absolutely going to encourage him to do it. So I had this moment of like, I hope they'll be okay. And they came back and they're like, it was completely fine. There was nothing to worry about. But you, you do have those moments of just uncertainty. Now, we're going to have to move on to your book. We're, we're, we're going from uh, 2018 back in time a little bit to 1997, Eckhart Tolle's classic blockbuster, the power of now. Yeah. Tell me about uh. <laughs> that, Jan. You know, when I suggested it, I thought, oh, no, am I going to sound like a cliche? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and the answer is absolutely yes. <laughs> but this book, so this, um, I came to this book in 2003, I want to say. Okay. Uh, and that was when I, um, I just dropped out of uni in 2002. Mm-hmm. I did an arts degree at Sydney Uni and I started uni very young. So I started uni at 16. Um, how, how, how so? Because uh, <laughs> um, my parents lied on the application into primary school. Good on them. Yeah. Yeah. Audacious. Well, like I was saying, we came here in 1989. I was four. Right. So I just. I was, and they said you were 12. And, and, they, <laughs> and they said I was five. <laughs> yeah. They said I was five, um, and and I I got in I got into kindergarten in in 1989, and I got in mid year in August. So if I'd started in January with the rest of the kids, I would have been three and a half. So I ended up graduating at 16, which 
is, I think, too young an age to graduate now in hindsight. I asked my dad, I said, do you regret putting me in school that young? Because I couldn't speak English. (laughs) I don't know what... (laughs) <laughs> and weren't you a little bit short? Didn't even notice. I was a toddler. <laughs> I was a non-English speaking toddler, and no one thought to rectify that issue. Um, you know, I think we had we'd just newly arrived. I think immigrants love them. I think they tend to sometimes think that laws are just suggestions. Yeah. Because that's maybe what <laughs> what they might have been used to in 1980s Lebanon. They're like, nah. It's just a suggestion. She'll be right. It's like, no, that's a state enforced law, Dad. I don't think you can tamper with that. Anyway, um, so I ended up graduating um, really young, and I just I wasn't ready for university. I was fine in school. I I, I did really well, and I, I loved it, and that was very successful. But I just wasn't ready to go to university at sixteen. You know, because it's the big world. Suddenly, you're in Sydney Uni. Um, you don't have to go to class which was amazing because I just kept thinking, you don't have to go. Why is everyone going? Yeah. It's crazy. Um, so I basically dropped out before I could fail. Yep. The lowest mark I got was 50.0, which put the fear of Jesus into me uh, because if you had a fail, that would stay on your record forever. In the end, no one ended up looking at my university transcript anyway, but... Um, I just thought I'm just going to drop out. And I, I went to Western Sydney and sort of started again. Okay. So I was at Sydney. I went to Western Sydney, started again on my HSC mark. And what I really wanted to do was journalism at, at UTS. And for that, you needed a score of, I think, 98.5 or something. It was very high. And I was determined in that year that I was going to go to UTS and I was going to do journalism. And so I just went balls to the wall, self-help, you know, <laughs> I just went, where's your self-help section? I'll take all of it. Thanks so much. Yeah. Um, so Anthony Robbins yeah. did that, unleash the giant within or something, you know, where you like look in the mirror and you say affirmations. Um, so I was doing all of that and that's how I stumbled on to Eckhart Tolle, uh, who had a book called The Power of Now. Um, it was one of the many books that I read, but it was probably the only book that really stuck with me to this day, you know, it's almost 20 years to this day. And there's a part of the book that says your past is not your identity and your future is not your fulfillment. And I just found that so freeing, you know, as a, I would have been maybe 18. I found that so freeing as an 18 year old that my past of doing badly at university is not my identity and I, I'm i not going to find ha- it, the future's not necessarily my fulfilment. Um, so what is, you know, and that really kind of honed in that present moment and, and living in the present and what that means to live in the present. And I think I've carried that with me ever since. A self-help book that worked. I think it worked. I mean, The Power of Now was, I think it, it I, I don't know if I would call it a self-help book more so than a, a life philosophy. So or spiritual. Yeah, yeah, a way of approaching life. There's there's another thing that, that he says in the book, which is watch the thinker. So what that does is it divides you, your you, Nigel, your being, into these two sort of elements of your thoughts and then the person who's actually able to distance from those thoughts and just watch them as they go by. And so that opened up the question of, okay, well, if you're not your thoughts, if if there are two of you, so to speak, the thinker and you, then who are you? How do you tap into that? How do you act from that? How do you go through life? Um, how do you move through the world as that? Um, and so I, I think that's probably why that stayed with me. Do, do you meditate? I try to. That the, yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, a no, uh, but yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 there's something in it, I mean, I'm sort of a dabble here and there, uh, um, but the, the notion of um, people think that they are behind their face. Mm. You go, wow. If you, if you said to somebody, you don't really think about a stupid question, I'm just, just, I'm just the fat white bloke that you're looking at, but you go, but where actually are you, Nigel? You go, well, I'm probably behind my face because that sort of is near where my brain is. And, and if you... If you break all that down and go, no, 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 no. It's just an amazing, mm. the, the philosophy of identity 
Who mm. are you? And the only thing that's special about you, apart from all the other lovely things, but it is memory. The only thing that's right. unique about you from seven years ago, because your, your body cells would have changed and blah, 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 and you'd have been different, it is your memory is unique to you. Right. Other people haven't got your memory. That's true, they don't. Isn't that amazing? But lots of other people have been to Sydney Uni. And, yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. anyway, it's just so lovely talking to you. Now, we're, we're going to move on to your third choice. And uh, this is, I, I love, this is a really fun part of the process because this is where I add a song to the Five of My Life Spotify playlist. So all the guest choices get put on this amazing playlist that's wonderful to listen to because it's very, very varied. And you have chosen for the first time on Five of My Life. Could, can you believe it? We've had Look lots out. of Beatles, lots of lots of Dylan, da da da. For the first time, an Elton John song. Uh. You've chosen uh, a, a song from his fourth album, Madman Across the Water. Uh, it was written by Bernie Torben for his wife, who then proceeded to run off with the bass player. So the song is called Tiny Dancer. He wrote another one called Terrible Dancer because she ran off. Uh, um, but, the, <laughs> but you've chosen Tiny Dancer, 1972. Tell me about that. Yes, uh, Tiny Dancer, that is... That's the song that my husband proposed to me. Oh, um, hey, the with. smooth mover, the six foot four. The whitest uh, man uh, in Australia. <laughs> ranger. Can you say ranger these days? Probably not. <laughs> yeah, he, um, that song was playing in the background when, when he proposed to me. And so it was sort of seared into my brain. I couldn't listen to it for a time because it was just so emotional. It was so intense, you know, in a really lovely, beautiful way, but I didn't particularly want to be crying on the way to a meeting in the car. When it comes on the radio, you just turn it off, you know. Um, Tell me about the, the proposal. Where, <laughs> where, where were you? So we, he's got a family holiday house um, in Nelson Bay, which is sort of past Newcastle, north of Sydney. And, uh, and he said, oh, let's go, let's go to the holiday house, um, you know, and, and we'd go there some weekends a year. I thought, all right, let's go to the holiday house. Great. Um, and so we sort of, we're driving to the holiday house. I've got no idea. And I, I pull in and there's some lights are on. And I remember saying, oh, that's unfortunate. Someone's left the lights on, just eating up power like that. I said, you should have a word to, you, <laughs> <laughs> to, to your family about, turn, about being environmentally conscious. And he's like, yep, no worries, you know. Um, and, uh, and so he sort of walks in ahead of me and opens the door uh, and I still have no idea, but on the table are maybe 100 candles and this massive bunch of flowers and this champagne chilling on ice. And my first reaction was, oh, someone's left all this stuff <laughs> behind. <laughs> I just thought... I thought, oh, no, someone's left all this stuff and now they're going to have to come back and get it and I just want to go to sleep. <laughs> I was like, and I said, I said, oh, is someone here? And I could sort of see him get a bit nervous and he was fumbling with the remote control to press play on Tiny Dancer. <laughs> <laughs> so it was all set up and ready to go. Um, and then the music starts playing and he says, you know, he says, no, no, there's no one here. And he kind of gets down on one knee and does the ring thing. And I'm like, and I still, I, I thought to my, I'm like, am I being proposed to? I'm not sure what's going on here. And it transpired that, yes, I was. And, you know, emotions run high, some tears, some, oh, my God, I can't believe this is happening, to the point where I didn't even say yes right. for like a solid 90 seconds to two minutes, which <laughs> is a long time to wait for an answer when you've asked someone to marry you. Um, and then I think he said, so, I, sorry, is that a yes? And I, went, <laughs> I went, yeah, that's a yes. Um, and then we just called everyone and said, oh, we're getting married and drank the champagne and blew out all the candles, obviously, fire hazard. Um, and it was really lovely. That's a gorgeous, that's a gorgeous story. How long have you been married? Uh, got married in uh, early 2016, so going on five years. Do you still blub when you hear it? Uh, no, 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 I don't. And you know, sometimes if I'm, if I'm mad at him the other day, I was like, I was a bit cranky for, I can't remember what reason. And Tiny Dancer came on and I was like, oh, shut up. Turned yeah. it off. You know, I was like, <laughs> I'm not listening to you right now. I but can't, 
I can't cope with this in this moment. So it, it depends on the mood is how I kind of react. To well, well, I hope I haven't ruined it with a story about the bass player. No, not at all. No, I think it'll take, it'd take a lot more to ruin Tiny Dancer for me, I think. Looking for a new career? Welcome to Do HVAC Training Service Center in North Charleston. Enroll today in our comprehensive HVAC training hands-on field experience-based program covering troubleshooting, maintenance, installation, and more on various HVAC systems and ductwork. We offer EPA and NAIT preparation and testing along with various certifications. Enjoy payment options. Achieve certification in under five months. Enroll now for your new journey of skill development and career advancement. Log on to DEWHVACTrainingSC.com to inquire. We're coming on to your place and just love this. I know you've shot documentaries all over the world. Uh, you have chosen a North Ugandan city, and I'm going to pronounce this wrong as well, Gulu? Gulu. Gulu. There you yeah. go. Now, tell me about that, Jan. Yeah, so that was um, a time in my life where I was living in Uganda um, and I... Hold on, hold on. You were living in Uganda. You can't just brush over that. <laughs> You're talking about Lebanon and France and now Australia. You were living in Uganda. Time out. Tell yeah. me about that. I'm going to have to rewind a little bit just quickly before I tell you about that. So I, before I lived in Uganda, I lived in Bangladesh for a year. Right. And I was working with UNICEF in a comms role in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And my partner at the time was setting up, was working with an NGO in Bangladesh and they wanted to set one up in Uganda. So that's what took me over to Uganda. It was sort of, he was going and I thought, well, I'll come too. So I, I was unemployed at this point. I had spent probably, if not my last dime, certainly close to on-camera equipment because I just knew that I wanted to start shooting stories. I knew I wanted to be making stuff. I knew I was, you know, abroad. Um and so I went and bought a camera, I bought two mics, I bought a small set of lights, I bought a tripod, I bought a backpack, so a sort of a little travel kit to be a video journalist. And I took that over with me to Uganda. And um, we spent, I think, two and a half months, I want to say, living in Kampala. And I spent three weeks of that on my own in northern Uganda, um, shooting sort of short documentaries with the intention of taking them back to someone in Australia and saying, oh, I was just in Uganda and I made these, you know, would you like them? Because I think sometimes if it's better to ask forgiveness than permission sometimes, most times I'd say, you know, I think if you went to a network and said, hey, I'm about to fly to Uganda, would you like to contract me for some stories? They'd be like, absolutely not. Do you know what the insurance premium is on that or something to that effect? So I was over there traveling on my own and um, and filming a bunch of short documentaries. Uh, are you a brave person? Uh, or foolhardy or neither? Crazy brave? Crazy brave. I don't I don't know if I no I'm not a brave person. No, I don't I don't think it's bravery to do that really. It it sounds scary. A uh, single woman in Uganda by... It sounds scary, doesn't it? It does. It wasn't. Okay. It wasn't. What's your best memory from that <laughs> time, from Galoo? Oh, man. I'd hired a driver who was sort of working for this NGO, and we were on our way to shoot an element of a story. And it was just me and the driver, and, you know, I had my phone, and, and it was, oh, my God, I think it was like a flip phone or something, you know, this is 2012. And we're driving, and it's coming close to dusk. We're in bushland at this point. We're in this kind of banged up car. The car gets stuck in a ditch. You know, when the wheels turn and mud just spurts out everywhere, that's sort of what it was. The car wasn't going anywhere. And he said, okay, wait here. I'm going to go and get some help. So he goes off 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, you know, dusk is approaching. And I sort of take a look around and I, I think to myself, okay, I'm in the northern Ugandan bushland with a man that I don't really know. No one knows I'm here. I've got one bar of reception 
on my phone, I don't know where I am or how to get out of where I am. This could go terribly. And I remember sort of just sitting there. I wasn't scared, but I was just, I had just clocked the situation. And then I hear footsteps. And I look up and there's three men walking towards me with machetes. And I don't know if you've ever seen a machete. I had never seen a machete. Yeah, terrifying. They are terrifying. They are massive 30 centimetre knives. Yeah, chop your limb off. They would chop a limb off. And they're approaching me, just the three of them. And I sort of had this moment of just like, oh man, if something, like if I die, my mum is going to kill me. Like that was, that was what, what went through my head was how angry my mother was going to be if something happened to me in that moment. And they approached and one of them came up to me and he said, hello. And I said, hello. And uh, they started hacking at the reeds of the wheel of the car and they raised the car and one of them pushed the car and, you know, got it out of the little sort of um, bit that it was stuck in and they went, all right, and I went, thank you. And my driver, I could see him kind of coming back and uh, and we got in the car and, and we thanked them and we drove away. So the driver hadn't gone to get them? They The driver had gone to get them uh, okay. and he had sort of fought. He was chatting right. to yeah, another person. <laughs> I mean, it was fine. The situation yeah. was fine entirely. He sort of just went and found some guys that could help. Yeah. But when you're... From my perspective, I had no idea what was going on. Yeah. And again, you know, I'm alone, it's dusk, the phone, all of these things. And, you you know, you, you see a sight of three men that you don't know mm. brandishing machetes. It's a lot. Yeah. You know, it's a lot to take in. Um, I'm angry on your mum's behalf. Yeah, it, well, she never found out. I think I told her I was in the Hunter Valley or something, or something ridiculous like that. But, yeah, she never found out. But the thing with, with Gulu, so that's sort of the, the area where it happened. It was this real kind of moment for me where I, I feel a bit ashamed of having bought into a lot of the stereotypes that you hear about countries like Uganda um, because you're only ever hearing terrible things, aren't you? And I always thought, oh, no, I'm, I'm savvier than that. I, I'm a journalist. I know how news is manufactured. I know that, you know, these things aren't a real representation of the reality and, and the humanity of people. Um, but I still got quite sort of caught up in, you know, well, what if it's dangerous? And, mm. um, you know, what if there's a lot of crime? And what if there's a lot of poverty? And it was one of the best trips I have ever done and and, and one of the greatest countries that I've ever been to. Um, and it was really being in that in that town that was supposed to be, you know, the town of Joseph Coney and, um, was supposed to be the kind of sort of a bit of an epicenter for all of the terrible stuff that had happened in Uganda, and it really wasn't any of that. At least, not that I saw mm. and not that I experienced. And you know that idea of oh, being brave to travel around the country by yourself for three weeks. I it was easy as yeah you know, and there were so many people that were willing to help you. Um, you know, one guy, I was waiting at the bus stop to, to catch a bus to somewhere and, and I didn't know him and he came up to me and he said, oh, um, you can get in that car. And I thought, I'm not going to get in a car. I said, no, thank you, you know, so it's keeping uh, arms folded sitting at the bus stop. And he said, no, 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 get in that car. And I said, no, I'm not, it's okay, thank you, I don't want to get in that car. And he went, all right, and walked off. And when he'd left, there was a woman who was sitting next to me and she said, He's trying to help you because he knows that the bus is going to be a lot more unpleasant yeah. than the car that he's just invited you to go into. And I thought, oh, what a dickhead. Not him, me. Yeah. You know, I thought, oh, man, I just assumed, well, I mean, so a stranger asks you to get to yeah, get into a yeah. car in a country that you've never been to that you don't know, you're probably not going to do it. It can go one of two ways. It can go one of two ways, exactly, and I think he had the best of intentions. Now, you mentioned your mum, which is a perfect segue to the last choice on Five of My Life. Uh, I love the possession 
choice. Uh, and, and you have hit it out the park, I think, because you have chosen your mother's 1984 honeymoon outfit. I, I need to hear about this. Yeah. Yes. That is one of my most prized possessions. It's the outfit that my mum wore on her honeymoon uh, in Damascus in 1984. Um, Could you describe it for us? Yeah. It, it, so it's a it's silk. It's um, blue, red and white. It's got flowers. It's a bit Kendoni-ish. Right, yep. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a, a, a pencil skirt that goes down to the knee and then there's like a matching silk top with it and a little silk belt that you tie it all together. So it's adorable. The reason why it's so prized for me, one, obviously it belonged to my mother, which is extraordinary, and she said that she, it was, she would earn something like 100 lira a month and it cost 300 you know, so it was three months' salary that she'd saved up for to buy this outfit for a honeymoon in Damascus. And I, for the last, well, almost two years, so beginning of 2019, haven't bought anything new. So I don't wear new clothes. I only wear vintage or used oh, I or love secondhand. That. I love that. Why? Well, two reasons. One, I think environmental sustainability. The more you look into how much waste is involved with clothing, how much we consume, but also how much we actually throw away and where that ends up, it's staggering. And all of the resources that it takes to make a t-shirt and and the human resources that it takes to make a t-shirt, it's it's a really unsustainable practice. I I don't know how better to put it. It, it. It cannot sustain if we keep so, so, so what you're wearing now is it hasn't been purchased. borrowed, stolen. Fabulous. Yeah, this Good uh, on you. skivvy, which a ter- black turtleneck, is my sister's. See, this is how I get around actually wearing things that I I want to buy, and I, say, I can't buy anything new, but I can take it from my sister's wardrobe <laughs> when she's not looking. <laughs> and she called me the other day and she said, "Do you know where my black turtleneck went?" And I went, "No," <laughs> <laughs> but I think she's cottoned on now to the fact that I take things from her wardrobe. Because it still counts, it's second hand. And, and is it, I mean, there must be some exceptions. Is it outer clothes? Yeah. You're, you're, you're okay. You're, I mean, you're, you're, you're you right. know, look, the, yeah. the delicates will, will buy new, <laughs> I think. The smalls, as they say. The in there. smalls <laughs> will, will buy new. Although I have bought secondhand swimsuits. Right. You know, I'm, if, if something's in good condition and, and it's fine, it's, it's okay for, for me, but it's difficult to find smalls yep. secondhand. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, we'll, we'll make a few ex- exceptions. So there's two reasons. So one was environment, so, which I love. Good on you. Oh, thank you. And what was the second reason? Uh, the second reason is creativity okay. and fashion and um, joy. I, I never thought for a minute, and this was, this was actually a byproduct, not so much the intention, um, but just a byproduct of the decision I made to not buy anything new, was just how, how much creative license it gives you. To wear whatever you want. I've been through your Instagram because, as you know, read, watched the film, read the book, blah, 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 and you look fantastic. Your style is fantastic. I mean, I mean, I'm not very fashion conscious, but but you, you you're rocking an individual style. Thank uh, you. Uh, but from my ignorant point of view, most much of fashion is sort of following the crowd, and what you do is in individual fashion, which takes uh, sort of almost going back to the bravery thing, which takes confidence. So I sort of need to ask you, where did you get that confidence from and were you always confident? Oh, um, I was probably always a little bit confident to an extent. At least that's what my parents will tell you, you know, as a child. Precocious is probably the right word. I don't like that word very much, but that's probably a suitable word to describe um, what I was growing up. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I know the reason why I did this and I I only ever do the next best thing, you know. I only ever do the next best thing and, and the decision that I made felt like the next best decision to make. Of I was amassing all of these clothes. I was working at SBS at the time and doing daily television and when you're on every night, you amass so many clothes and you're buying them from these sort of, you know, ch- cheapish places, not all the time, but you're cycling sort of through them and they accumulate in your cupboard and they've got nowhere to go. And so the next best decision was, okay, we've got to do something about this. Surely there's a better way. And I just had so much fun doing it that the next best decision was to continue. 
And I had so much fun doing that that the next best decision was to continue doing that, you know. So it wasn't necessarily planned that I would be here. I was. It was only really ever, you know, the plan for a year and just to see how I would go. And I kind of just loved it so much that I sort of kept doing it. And the responses were good. You well, know? Is, well, well, I find that encouraging. One, one of the other uh, guests we've had on, uh, Tyron Brumfit, runs the body image movement. And I, I, I love people who are uh, sort of good role models where, where there will be some people who would feel, uh, I'd like to wear that flamingo shirt or those high-waisted pants or whatever it is, but oh, that's not what all the other girls in the office are wearing or whatever, so I, I yeah. can't. I have to. And, and you, you do it with confidence and you look great and it might give other people you know, confidence to also do it. So, so the good response, where do you get that from? Is that from Instagram or somewhere? Or, well, I think sort of from social media or from people who might see you around, they go, oh, where did you get that dress yeah. from? You know, you're like, found it in a bin, mate, you know? <laughs> 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 and, that's, and I always, it's like a badge of honour for me. Stole it from a sister. <laughs> yeah. It's, I feel like I have to tell them the full backstory as well because yeah. I'm so proud that I found this thing in a bin. Yeah. So you, just the responses from people in general but sometimes I do feel a bit self-conscious about it because I don't do it for attention. I do it, I wish that everyone wore outrageous clothing. Like I just wish that was the norm and so you could walk into a room and not stand out in any way but be surrounded by people who are wearing, you know, and who are wearing new, inventive, crazy things that you can go, oh, what's that? And just appreciate that would be my ideal scenario. So sometimes I want to go to, you know, certain events and I think, oh, is that too crazy? That feels a bit too crazy. Okay, let's on, on let's the tone t- it down a bit. On the too crazy uh, criteria, are, are padded shoulders ever going to come back? Oh, padded shoulders, oh, that's the only thing I, they're the only jackets I wear. I love it. Padded shoulders. <laughs> All get, of my jackets have padded shoulders. Oh, get, yeah. You get the, the full dynasty, do you? The full Alexis Carrington, baby. <laughs> the full, and the 80s, the height of fashion. You heard it here first. I stand by that. I said what I said. The 80s was just, it was... Leg, I, leg warmers? Oh, not yet, but I'm not adverse to leg warmers. Now, now, and you do, you're not doing it today, but you do big hair sometimes as well, don't you? Yeah, I do. So, so shoulder pads, big hair, yeah, that's it. it's my decade. I really feel like I came of age in the wrong decade. <laughs> Should have come of age in the 80s. It's and your I'm, parents getting your age wrong again. That's what it yeah, is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's right. So we are going to come on to our... Um, Six traditional question where you've got to now do what Jamila did to you. So I would like to hear the name of the person that you would like to hear on Five of My Life next, please. You know, okay. The reason I'm choosing this person is because I just, I want to hear an interview with them um, where they're approached in this sort of manner, you know, like what book do you like? What movie do you like? Um, rather than an interview where you feel like you have to, nail them on a particular issue or flesh out a particular topic. Um, And I didn't think that I would pick this person, but I'm curious. So the person that I'm going to suggest is Jackie Lambie. Jackie Lambie, locked in. We will get on the blower to dear old Jackie if she's still in Tasmania. That is the one you're thinking of. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jackie in Tasmania. I'd like to know what Jackie's favourite film is. So, so would I. what her favourite song is. She, she's not backwards and coming forwards, is she? She's a very opinionated lady. I think so. I, yeah. don't, I don't think you'll have too much trouble getting Jan. Well, I don't know. But that's your problem now, Nigel, <laughs> not mine. <laughs> now, now, Jan, Frank, this has been a, just a delightful, delightful conversation. I cannot thank you enough for coming out of Vibe My Life. So oh, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. The Five of My Life was presented by me, Nigel Marsh. Producer, Alex Mitchell. Sound production and theme music by Darcy Thompson and Matt Nicholish. 